Uh, but next up, I'm really excited about this session. We are going to dive into the secrets of social media. As we all know nowadays, it's harder and harder to break through no matter what social channel you're talking about, but to show us some ways that you can break through, that you can reach consumers in really creative ways. Uh, we're going to hear from Joe Orin and Dave Schneider from That Light. Let's give them a big round of applause. Yes. Hello, Lisbon. Hello, after lunch, Lisbon, slightly. Oh, I had too much to eat. Um, yes. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, creativity and the secret of success with paid social, uh, Joe and myself. So by way of introduction, uh, my name is David Schneider. Um, I am an actor, comedian, writer, director. Uh, my last film was The Death of Stalin. If you went to see that, thank you for your support. If you haven't, still available for download. Um, and um, I built up a following uh, on social media, on Twitter and Facebook, um, by I think doing a lot of politics and a lot of um, jokes. Um, that's what I like to think, but actually I think a lot of people uh, follow me because they think I'm actually David Schwimmer from Friends. Uh, like this person here is a Friends reunion episode on the cards. I really like this one actually because uh, it's actually a reply to me getting angry about uh, the rise of the far right in Austria, um, which is not an episode of Friends that I remember. Um, but anyway, they all count, all followers count. So, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about how I ended up here and with Joe, um, in as much as um, to justify all the time I wasted on Twitter and on social media, um, I set up a social media company called That Lots. We do um, content that innovative, original, shareable content that cuts through for brands and broadcasters. I employ all sorts of very, very young people. Honestly, I don't know whether to um, um, give them work or read them a story after lunch. They're so young. Um, uh, and what we do is, is for many years, a couple of years, um, everything was fine. Everything was rosy in the, in the organic garden that we as content creators uh, played in. So we did um, a lot of copy, a lot of uh, jokes, such as this one for a tea company. Uh, Don't you wish your boyfriend was hot like tea? Um, we would do uh, imagery like this one for uh, Nat Geo, National Geographic, where we took a one of their covers and broke it down and reassembled it to make it sort of more thumb stopping and resting. That does well, did very well organically. One of our clients is uh, Channel 4, a UK broadcaster. And we had really, we worked out how to make that work uh, for video. I'm doing a talk on video tomorrow as well. I've got huge numbers for that, um, as you can see. Uh, it was all really, really rosy and in Organic Park, which is where we lived um, as the Organicosaurus that we were. Like how many more times can I say the word organic? But that's what we were doing. And then suddenly, a meteor approached, and that meteor was paid. Um, and the, when the algorithm changed and everything shifted to paid, at which point I went, oh, we need to pivot, we need to change, we need a paid expert, which brings me to Joe, who joined us. To Joe. Thank you, David. So I am uh, the meteoric Joe, so to speak. So a little bit about me just to kick things off. So uh, my name's Joe. I am a head of paid strategy at that lot. Uh, I have worked in uh, social media for nine years. That's across uh, ad agencies, content marketing agencies, PR as well. Uh, my favorite social platform is Instagram. That's both uh, in terms of advertising and as a user. Uh, my all-time favorite client is Big Bus Tours. Uh, don't worry if you haven't heard of them, we'll come back to them in a bit. And my degree, in case you care, is completely unrelated to what I do. I studied medieval history. Now, today's talk's going to be a little bit Facebook heavy, but 
within reason, and I'd just like to explain why. So, firstly, uh, Facebook uh, gives us the best targeting options as advertisers, and we all know why. It's because they know the most about us. Uh, it's the largest social audience, well over uh, a billion active users. Uh, it gives us the best range of ad formats, which also translates to the widest range of creative formats for us as an agency. Uh, it's the most cost-effective, although I say this the day after having had some real success with the Twitter campaign, so there's still plenty of scope out there, uh, aside from Facebook. And of course, uh, Facebook own Instagram and WhatsApp, which means that we can use uh, Facebook's own native ads manager to distribute on those platforms too. Although, of course, WhatsApp is still kind of developing on that front. And of course, they are the market leader. So what we tend to find is that if Facebook does it, the other platforms will follow suit eventually. And the, and the reason why we as a creative company, social media companies, got hold of Joe and started building up our strategy thing was because of the 1%. And by that, I don't mean the 1% that control 99% of uh, the world's economy. If any of you are in, thank you. See you later. Um, well, it's because the Facebook's organic reach for business on business pages is now less than 1%. That's not to say that you can't have huge hits still with organic content, and we still do. So Channel 4 had 6.2 billion organic views last year. We expect the same this year. And Have I Got News For You, which is one of our, uh, uh, it's a satirical account. Um, it has 6.8 million post engagements, uh, all organic. So you can still have success, but we knew that really it was time to, um, to look at paid because of that 1%. One, 1%. Now, there's other, another couple of advantages of paid, which I'm sure you all know about, but we just wanted to touch on very briefly. So this example here, uh, Brewdog is a craft brewery based in the UK. Uh, in this specific post, they're giving away free beer to people in Birmingham. Now, that's great if you live in Birmingham. If you don't live in Birmingham, it's probably a little bit annoying. So using paid social media, we can guarantee that we only reach people in Birmingham. And we need to distinguish between people in this is Birmingham, UK, so Ozzy Osbourne, where he's from, not Birmingham, Alabama, where Condoleezza Rice is from. Important to tell the difference between those two. And uh, another obvious advantage of paid social media is that, so in that specific example, not everyone who lives in Birmingham is going to follow the brand, yet with paid, we can ensure that we reach every person in Birmingham that we want to. And at the core of everything we do now um, is to not make a difference between content and ads, organic and paid. And what we do is make sure that our approach when it comes to creative, when it comes to landing the content uh, is, is the same. It's not, it's ad tent, if you like, or, or contads, or actually we don't have a word for it. But what I'm trying to say is ads and content, we treat them in the same way. Um, creatively and that's what's really important for us so yeah so so to just give you an example when it comes to the creative for any paid unit you want to make it interesting you want to make it thumb stopping um, because what's important is not the amount of money that you put behind something if you put a huge amount of money behind a stone and think right I've done my paid I've put two hundred thousand dollars behind that that'll be fine it is still a stone it's better to put a little bit less money behind something um, that is beautiful like a diamond spend a bit more money on the creative and then it'll work more effectively um, because what paid does it offers you, you can, it allows you to knock on certain doors, but it's only if your creative is really strong that you'll be invited in. So building on what David said there, um, I was very aware of that lot before I joined. And the reason I was aware of them was because of the strength of their organic content. Now, obviously the team uh, at that lot were great at organic content, but when I joined, there was a little bit of a task to do. And that task was basically training people up. So I did a lot of training sessions. So I divided them out by discipline. So the accounts team had one specific training session uh, tailored to them, as did uh, the uh, creative team. Now, one of the key things uh, I kind of flagged straight away was that very much building on their ads equal content thing is that basically everything is shoppable now. You can uh, add a shoppable tag on uh, every piece of post. So if it's a piece of brand content, you can still make it shoppable. You can still drive through. I think I've lost my headset. No, I'm good. Um, uh, so which is why I think, you know, another thing we did was uh, make sure we start at the beginning. So that was uh, planning for success with a distribution strategy. So I'll kind of give you an example for that one. So. The key thing to uh, explain to the team was uh, that we need to align those business goals with objectives, but then also follow that through to metrics. So let me bring that alive with a little example here. So if the client comes to us and they want to promote a new product, uh, what we need to do is we need to interrogate that and to think, what are we actually being asked to do? 
So the objective there is actually awareness. People don't know about this product. We need to introduce it to them, get it in front of them. But then also we need to make sure that we're being successful with what we're doing. So that's where we put metrics in place. So the metrics in place that align with uh, that business goal, that objective, uh, would be reach and impressions, uh, ad lift recall, which I'm going to have to try and get this right. That is the uh, volume of people who will recall seeing your ad 48 hours having seen it. It's a fairly new metric and it's quite a wordy one to explain. And also video views are uh, really successful in terms of driving awareness of a new product, of course. And at the core of our paid strategy, the same with the organic again, again, it's always the same, is platform specificity, being absolutely specific to the platform, using the formats uh, that the platform offers you so that you stay looking native, so carousels, canvases, etc. whatever the paid unit is, you want to be as native as possible. All right, Joe? Yep, 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 yep. Sorry, guys. Um, so we need to think about formats and placements. Dramatic pause whilst he has a bit of water. I didn't actually need a sip then. I was just trying to be dramatic, absolutely. So we need to think about formats and placements. So what I mean by that is uh, video is no longer simply video. So we'll kind of talk through all the different formats and different placements of video, or just a, a couple, for example, but we just wanted to show that you need to think about these things. So firstly, um, this is a piece of content uh, we did for Fox. So this is an Instagram uh, carousel. This is actually static image uh, going into video. And, and this is a good example. I don't know if you ever have to repurpose assets. We have to do that quite a bit. So this is a 16 by 9 piece of TV footage, uh, which we've made platform specific by turning it into uh, a 16 by 9 image, then video on a carousel. And you can see how it teases across by only having some of the, some of the words in the first uh, image. So it's a nice example of repurposing that, that works organically, but also works uh, for paid. So the next examples are a little bit more direct response led. So you can see it's got the book now call to action in there. Uh, this was for IHG, which is a hotel chain. So obviously we're trying to drive people through to make a, a purchase. Um, so this is a, uh, another carousel, but the great thing I like about this is the way the butterfly moves through those frames. It's literally encouraging people to swipe through to follow that story. And it's just a simple idea, cheeky idea in the creative to make people want to, um, want to swipe all the way through. Now, we've looked at uh, formats there, but we actually want to look at placement here. So this is a piece of content that was made specifically with mobile in mind. So think about it. You're going through Facebook, and you've got a video pop up, and it perfectly fits the screen straight away. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. If you're playing around with your phone trying to get it to fit, immediately you're kind of losing interest. You're going to move on straight away. And uh, the next example we have, so this is an Instagram uh, stories video carousel, get that right. Um, so this is three 15-second uh, video frames put together. There's only two in this example, I should clarify. Um, the great thing about this one, uh, so obviously it's a fairly new format for us. Uh, we've put the uh, tap to view product on there, the shoppable element. Um, a little thing to note here is that uh, at work, some people refer to it as sponsored stories. And I'm always very clear to point out that it's not technically a sponsored story. It's actually a video placement. So essentially what you can do is you can put together three 15-second uh, video formats. Now, the key thing with that is actually making it look like it's an Instagram story, making it look native to the platform. If it doesn't look like it's an Instagram story, people are going through, they don't like it, they'll swipe through. You've got to make it look like it fits in there. And that's where you take something that's paid but you make it look as close as possible to something organic so that people don't, don't move on and ignore it. So there's different strengths to each of these formats. So we really need to think about those as advertisers and make sure that we're actually playing up to that. So the example I'm gonna talk about here for a second is in-stream video. Now, I'm sure you all know in-stream video. It's, uh, so it's on Facebook. It's when you're watching a, a piece of long form content from a publisher. So that could be, uh, it could be Vice, it could be The Guardian. And then all of a sudden in the middle of it, you get the little ad notification pop up. It starts playing, we've all seen it. So what do we know about this? So we know that it's five to 15 seconds in length, which is actually, you know, it's short, so it's good, it's snappy, it's punchy. We can use that to introduce a new product to people. There's a 70% view through rate. That's really, really high. The reason being, it's popped up in the middle of something. People want to continue watching the video. Thus, 70% of people will watch it all the way through. It plays uh, mostly with sound on. Again, this is a real rarity uh, on Facebook. Uh, so that's really, really helpful for us. We know that actually people are going to hear literally what we're saying. And 
don't forget, it is, it is literally disruptive. We are jumping up in the middle of a longer form piece of content they're watching. So in terms of creative, you can play with all these different elements here. You, there's little truths that we can work with. So another thing I wanted to flag is that we see on average about 5,000 ads a day. That's a lot. And I really firmly believe in uh, kind of like perverting expectation, making things stand out from the crowd. And that's another thing that we're carrying over from organic. So this is like an organic piece of content. It's uh, for B&Q, which is a household DIY company. And you can see there's uh, tweets, two tweets, but it looks like they were pouring paint across the two of them. So that just uh, it's what we call a timeline invasion. It just stops those thumbs. It's some, something slightly different. Similar thing here um, for Facebook, which is for Eagle Moss that make little collectible models. They wanted us to promote uh, something for um, this face hugger alien model that they had. Uh, so you have the uh, time, it looks like your timeline, but then, uh, then it isn't. And it's just that, whether it's paid or organic, constantly pushing the creative to see what you can do. Great. So uh, we've got a case study for you now just to kind of bring everything to life a little bit. So Big Bus Tours, uh, for those of you who don't know, it is an open top uh, bus tour. They operate in about 20 cities globally, I think. Uh, not in Lisbon, I'm sorry. Um, so you, you, we've all seen it. We've all been on one. If you look to the left, you'll see the Houses of Parliament, etc., etc. So the client came to us and they had two main objectives. And those objectives were firstly, driving awareness of Big Bus Tours to tourists. And secondly, then driving through to ticket purchase. It's all very good driving awareness, but actually they wanted to follow it up with ticket purchase. So the challenge we had, uh, obviously, introduce big bus tours and sell tickets. So we had kind of a two-phase uh, distribution uh, approach, and that was creatively split between the two objectives. So the first objective was awareness. And the key thing to flag here is that we need to be reaching the right people at the right time. And those right people are tourists who are in cities where big bus tours operate. So the way we do that. So um, I have my phone. It's in my pocket. Uh, Facebook knows that I live in London because that's where I use the app. However, right now it knows that I'm a tourist because I'm in Lisbon. I'm away from my home. So we can target people that way. So that's what we did for the awareness point. That made sure that we reached just the right people. And then uh, there was a little bit more to that awareness part. Actually, we also did uh, a bit of a traffic driving job. We drove people through to the ticket pages for the specific cities they were in. We did this because it gave us a larger pool of people to retarget. So we literally did website retargeting in phase two, driving people, uh, retargeting people who hadn't made a purchase but had been to the ticket page. So this phase one creative. So we tested a lot of different creatives. We didn't just go, this is our approach and we stuck with it. We tried different things. So this specific example here uh, is for New York. So imagine you're a tourist in New York. You get served a piece of mobile first content on your phone. It's literally plastering the name of the company on the side of the most iconic building in New York. It really, really gets the message across effectively. So another ad format we used uh, was uh, Instant Experience or Canvas, uh, as it used to be known. Uh, so this is a really deeply engaging ad format. It really introduces uh, the product very well. It talks about the experience. Uh, on the next bit, when it goes through, there's a lovely little gamification element. So we, we use the strengths of the platform. So there's kind of a carousel option we can use. So we, we played with that and uh, came up with this little uh, touch here. Now, another real advantage of uh, uh, instant experience is that it's actually a really effective traffic driver. So you can see here, you swipe up to book, and that will land you directly on the, the ticket page, uh, which again, the more people go through to the ticketing page, the more website retargeting we can do. So on Joe's side, he's thinking about how can we target effectively? And on our side, the sort of creative, we're thinking of things like the gamification and how people enjoy just swiping the three sections so that they can make the Statue of Liberty. Um, so here's another example of where sometimes you go, oh, make a fantastic video, it costs tens of thousands of pounds or whatever. Um, but sometimes people just like something simple. So this is uh, big bus tours for Dubai. Um, and as, as part of it, we had a, a, an element where they just hear it is to tap to drive the bus. So people just like this had a 97% view through, which is insane, just because people just like tapping like a seven year old um, and making the, the bus move. So sometimes it doesn't have to be a half a million pounds worth of video. It's just that simple creative idea that can be really effective. So the phase two element, so this was the website retargeting part of things. So 
one thing we know as advertisers is that the most effective way of driving a direct response is using a really linear, static piece of content. So in this specific instance, this creative will be delivered to people who have been to the ticketing page for Las Vegas and not made the purchase. What we're serving to them is a picture of the bus alongside the Las Vegas sign. It really, really keeps that connection strong, keeps it really clear. Also, what we did was we put a little incentive in the copy as well there. So save 10% when you pre-book online. So I know I just said that direct response, uh, you want to use static image. However, we actually tried something a bit different. Testing and learning has been really key to our approach. So what we did was we created these little vignettes that show the experience of being on a live guides, of being on a big bus tours with one of the live guides talking through and showing how everything works. By actually using this creative, we were able to drop uh, the costs per click by about 30 or 40%. So again, that test and uh, learn approach really, really works strongly for us. So here's our results. So this is month one versus month five. So obviously in that interim time, we've been trying different creative formats, trying different approaches. So uh, between month one and month five, we were able to link increase impressions by 112%. Uh, engagements uh, increased by 80%. Uh, clicks to sites by 182%. Now that's really uh, a key one there. So we're able to increase clicks to site from 2,000 to over 6,000. That basically means that we have a larger pool for uh, uh, website retargeting in phase two. And that also directly shows there in our return on ad spend. Grew from 911% to over 1,600%. So that's an improvement of uh, 760%. And just to really, yeah, 1,671%. Yeah, so, and I think the reason why those figures are so good, it's a relatively small um, uh, uh, project, but it shows just how, if you combine good creative with good uh, paid strategy, then it can, it can, really, um, it can really work. So, sorry, so we've talked a bit, so we wanted just to leave you uh, with some kind of takeaways and top tips. So the first thing I'll say is be flexible and test everything. Uh, I've just talked about the success we had between month one and month five there. We made that improvement by testing different formats. Um, another thing I will say is try and plan one objective for each piece of content. Don't think we need to introduce a new product. We need to engage people about it. We need to drive them through to a website. We need to make a purchase. Don't try and do that in one go. Actually break those objectives out, retarget and deliver in the right order. Um, jump on new ad formats. Uh, Facebook and Instagram are throwing plenty our way at the moment, especially on stories. So what I will say is uh, try them out, see how they go. Maybe they don't work, maybe they do. But it's definitely worth trying it. And also, it's always nice to be a market leader as well. And don't expect to get things right the first time. I think this is where I really need to mention the importance of some really, really strong uh, website, re uh, website retargeting, uh, <laughs> reporting. We need to have some really strong reporting in there uh, just to make sure that everything is working well. So we've got uh, just a, a couple of minutes left. Maybe we could take a question or two from the sophisticated Q&A thing on the app. Um, so, uh, well, there's a question. Will organic content fade out eventually with the invasion of paid media? That is a great question. Um, I think it kind of has in a way. I mean, if you've got a, a big brand, you're looking at probably half a percent, maybe less in terms of organic reach. I mean, it's always going to be different for publishers. Obviously, we've talked about Channel 4, one of our clients. They're a publisher. They're always going to get better results there. Um, I mean, I would say also that, um, yes, there's, um, uh, paid is very strong now, but you still need organic. You need your earned and you need your owned. You need to be um, making people aware of you. There's still so much uh, brand awareness and love and shares and earned media, not just on social, but that goes beyond social from actually having quality organic, or maybe you put a bit of paid behind it, but owned and earned. So today we've been talking about paid and how important it is to make sure that your paid creative is really effective. But I don't think you should neglect the earned and owned as well. Um, so I don't think it's the death uh, of organic forever, but I think just, we just we're going through an age where paid is more and more significant. Um, so just to, just to wrap up finally, because we've run out of time, I, I've sort of been going on about this metaphor of the stone and the diamond for about a year now, thinking I was really clever, you know, you know put your money behind a diamond, not a stone. Um, but actually, thanks to this talk and what Joe's been going through, I realized that I need to refine that metaphor a bit better and that you need to use it's no point throwing a diamond at people. You need to refine exactly what people want through targeting, through data, through test and learn, so that you give them, if they want a diamond ring, you give them a diamond ring. So 
I think now it's like about, yes, getting great creative, so the diamond rather than the stone, but also making sure that that's great creative that's informed by data, targeting, and testing and learning. Uh, and that, my friends, is all from us. So I say obrigado. Thank you, Joe, for your insights. Thank you very much. And see you very soon.